Enter the Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Experience. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, presented by DraftKings. Smash the like, sub to the channel, as we continue talking about golf with Eric Patterson. EPAT is back on the show. Gone are the days of the other side of the wall for EPAT. He's back on the content side. It's good to have you back, dude. Uh, it's uh, one of the perks of being able to uh, you know, talk about golf is jumping on this show, so I'm happy I jumped back onto the content side of things. Um, yeah, looking forward to to breaking it all down. It should be fun. So I really wanted to get some of your perspective and as much as you can tell me on the other side of the fence, working on the operations side of a sports book and primarily how a lot of the stuff is constructed, especially as it pertains to golf betting odds. Was there, I mean, you didn't have any experience in setting odds or working on the operator side of things until you took the job, right? Yeah, other than, you know, kind of making your own odds as we all tend to do um, in this space. And it's really the, the best way um, to kind of find value on guys is if you have your own kind of system. Um, but yeah, I didn't have a ton of experience. Uh, the, the score bet when I started was a, a small shop in a few states and we, we needed someone to kind of help manage the golf side of things. And they brought me in. Um, I had a obviously a good, at least a, a good enough understanding of of the golf market, the players that were involved, um, kind of the tournaments and and you know how every tournament is sets up. As as you can know, you you get into a bit of a rhythm with golf betting. Um, you do this every week, Pat. You you guess the odds on Saturday or Sunday, and you know your top fifteen, top twenty guys are pretty spot on. So you you have a good sense of how it's done. Um, and then, yeah, we, we, on that side of things, we do a very similar process where we'll, you know, group the players in, in sort of tiers and, and price them based on that, obviously factor in a little bit of course history, factor in some recent form, um, and then, yeah, keep it within the market. Uh, it's a, it's a game of buying and selling. And, um, you know, you, if you're selling at a price that other play, other, you know, operators in the space are, are selling at a different pl price, then you either have to adjust or, or hold firm um there's a there is a lot that goes into it but at the same time it's not rocket science uh you get a good gauge of the market based on a few tournaments to figure out how your betters like to bet so um yeah there's there's a there's a little bit of a formula to it a little bit of personal uh you know the, the bookmaker can have their say on a few guys and um you know you you post those things monday morning and and see what prices guys liked and what what prices betters didn't like and, and adjust as the week goes on. So I always I have two questions about this. I'll double barrier. I'm pulling a Jeff Feinberg on you, asking you eight questions at one time and expecting <laughs> you to remember all of it. Actually, I'll start with this. So let's say Russell Henley at the Travelers Championship is a good example. It seemed like everyone wanted to bet him. So he opens at, I think it was 70 to 1, 80 to 1 in some places. And the market kind of decides 55 to 1 is going to be the number, 50 to 1 is going to be the number but everything kind of crashes down to that one spot. Now, if you let's say you're sitting there and you're saying, you know, Russell Henley's probably not going to win. What is the harm of saying, you know what? We'll go the other way with this. We'll make it 80 to entice everyone who wants to. Everyone's saying bet Henley, hey, bet Henley, bet Henley. I guess people would probably bet him anyway because of FOMO, but could you go the other way with that and be like, yeah, he's probably not going to win. Let's give him a better price to suck more people in. If that was the if that was the logic behind a risk and management <laughs> trading team, I feel like you are just taking the company's money and almost gambling with it in a way. Um, just because you know, obviously, everyone has a chance of winning. Yes, some guys have 0 0.001 chance. There's the guys, the field fillers at the bottom, who are probably never going to win these things. But just because they're in the event, they have a chance. Like Michael Block at the PGA, he had a chance to win. I mean, it was a slim one, but you still had to factor in those with his odds. So saying they have no chance, that's it's a dangerous game to play, especially when there's that much money on the line and, and you know, companies trying to be there and try to make money. So uh, there's really no point um, in going to the 80 in this scenario, whereas, you know, you're going to get buyers at, at 55, at 60. Um, and then there's just, you're probably not going to draw as much business or attention as you might think, um, just by increasing them to 80, just because it is someone like Russell Henley. I mean, Tiger, Tiger Woods at majors is maybe a, a bit of a different, uh, discussion where, you know, you'll see prices all over the place when the demand is so high for a player 
um, that's where you know you can kind of take a stance and keep your keep your price more in line with the market, whereas other books might, in theory, you know, trade off a bit off liability and, and try to manage their risk that way. So, um, you know, it is risk management. We are on the we are on the inside of the desk where we're trying to not get crushed. At the same time, we do want to give the best prices of this, um, to the customers and, and try to, uh, you know, have them you know, give them an appealing set of odds, whereas, you know, they just don't close the app immediately and say these prices are junk. So um, it's a bit of a balancing act. Um, but yeah, it's, I would find it very rare and almost, uh, you know, irresponsible to just go from 50 to 80 because you think someone's a very popular play. I, I would think of it more and listen, I'm not doing the risk management on it. And all of a sudden you get two or three like legitimate sharps with big bets coming in and all of a sudden it makes it unprofitable. But if you are a smaller book versus some of the bigger books, setting the better number is almost like free advertising in a way if you were trying to get new customers because people say, you know, it's 50 everywhere else. It's 80 here. Why don't you go sign up for here? And if you're trying to attract new players that way, I guess with you guys, that's not really uh, that big of a deal because so many people have the score app that you know just the click-through percentage alone from the score app onto the betting page has to be super high at this point yeah i mean that was definitely one of the uh, i don't know if it's like a selling point but definitely we had a leg up on some of the competitors just in terms of being in ontario and having the score as a, a pretty recognizable brand um and you know, our whole business was based on, if you go back to the TV days, we've always had odds on the ticker. Um, you know, we had guys like Cam Stewart and Gabe Morenci on our, on our channel back in the day, talking about betting before it was even, um, close to being legal in, in North America. So it's been kind of a, a heartbeat of the score. Um, and just being able to transfer those users into, into betting users is, uh, obviously a, an advantage that we had, but I, I see what you're saying about the free advertising. Um, I would say smaller books, I feel like, yeah, they have a, a big disadvantage because, you know, the, the bigger your prices are, the more the less money in theory you're going to uh, end up winning. And in a game of, you know, market share and and trying to, you know, win as much money as possible or, or have the most betters as possible, it's, it's hard to kind of find that balance when, you know, if you if you pulled all the odds from all the sports books, in, in let's say in an outright market because we're talking golf um the the theoretical hold or the or the over round would be pretty much similar for for all competitive books um it's it's in that you know 140 percent to 150 percent range on a monday um obviously as the tournament gets closer the prices should inflate a little bit just as as the market kind of stabilizes but um, you know, those smaller books, if they open at 130% where, you know, they're offering a lot larger prices on a number of guys, it's just going to be harder for them to make money in the long run. For sure. And, but maybe that's what they have to do to lure people to their sites. I know that I use yeah. a few books that are like that. And even though they typically offer better prices, I still don't utilize them as my main book and just kind of forget about it sometimes. So maybe it's, and I'm someone who's betting every single week. And they're probably trying to draw a one off here to get people on. But if people are going to price shop anyway, they're probably in tune with how many books are going to be there. So there's no real point. So understood on that one. I do want to throw out for the Travelers Championship, if you're watching this on the Tuesday or Wednesday, the bet that we talked about, I released it on Twitter as soon as I kind of did the quick math. I didn't have it on hand while I was doing the show with Jeff, but the bet 365 players under par bet of 74 players. Uh, it opened at plus 225. While we discussed it on the show, it was plus 190. I bet it at plus 175. It's currently plus 130 as we record this, and I'm guessing it's going to be minus something um, sometime in the near future. Maybe even as you're watching this, I did the pricing on it, just you know, quick hand math, that it's probably a good play up to minus 250, based, unless there's some sort of crazy weather that's coming in, because uh, the field's a little bit stronger this year, and 102 players went under par last year, 109 in 2021. I don't understand, Eric, how this is still a bet at this point. <laughs> yeah, Pat, I mean, you might be onto something here. This is, um, it seems like a newer market. These are markets that, you know, sports books will put up to gauge interest. Um, and you're talking about this, this market. Uh, people are going to go use that app and, and place that bet. And while they're there, they're probably going to bet other things like outrights where they're, you know, they're probably not going to win. So it could be, uh, maybe going back to what you're talking about, 
a little bit of an advertising for them, um, drawing up interest on a on a market that probably has low limits. They're probably not taking that many bets. Um, guys like yourself are betting them, and you know if if you're the one telling them their price is wrong, then they're probably going to go adjust it. Um, there's maybe some maybe other sharper betters out there that are betting it as well and moving that line too. So um, it's probably a low risk kind of low limit. It's not going to crush them type market, whereas, um, you know, it's it's a bit different for some of the more mature markets. So uh, I would expect they adjust slowly as, as you keep promoting it. But uh, for now, it seems like uh, you're in a you're in a good win win situation. Almost you're getting you're getting good closing line value, at least I'm getting great closing line value. And I've now won it three straight times and it hasn't even been go. relatively close. And it's really offsetting all the losses that I'm having in the outright market. It's fantastic. I mean, that's it. They're keeping you happy. They're keeping, uh, you know, your your business. So uh, as long as you're breaking even, I feel like that's a win. You, you'd like to sell yourself a little sh short, Pat. I think you're a lot sharper than you, you give yourself credit for. I'm not here to pump your tires, but this is a type of market where sharp betters would attack and, and you're exhibiting those behaviors. Well, Paul said, watch out because you might get limited. But I had to remind him and he I even made the point like NFL season's coming up soon because all that money's going back into the reserve. <laughs> Maybe you'll be you might you might get limited until yeah September fourth and then they'll crank it back up for football season. How does that work in terms of being limited? Is it the amount that people win? Is it a profile of always getting the best lines possible and just constantly being ahead of the closing line value? Um, because I know some people who bet a lot and win a lot and they don't get limited, and then you have other people who win like three straight bets and then all of a sudden they're limited at spots. It's just, is there a rhyme or reason to it, or is it just a profile of the types of bets that you're looking for? Yeah, that that's the latter part without giving out too much information, <laughs> but it probably is. I mean, it's common sense at this point. It is the profile of better that, um, you know, people are looking for trading teams are looking for. Um, if you're betting, you know, Sunday mornings on NFL Sunday, those bets, 99.9% .9 of them are completely fine. The, the market's mature. The lines are sharp, efficient. Um, you should be able to, you know, sports books should be comfortable laying any bet on a, on a football game comes Sunday morning. But if you're, you know, you're hammering the opening line on a Monday or the week before, and you know, they're getting two, three points of closing line value, the price has moved from whatever, minus 110 to minus 180. Um, those are the bets that, you know, you, you're as a risk and trading team, you're trying to control or trying to, um, you know, you're using that type of information to make sure that the market's efficient. There's professional betters everywhere they're always gonna be able to find an angle um it's not about just cutting them and axing them it's about trying to find a happy medium where you know they're still happy to bet you're going to use their information to in theory um you know provide the market with a more efficient price and have kind of people um, bet the more efficient price whereas uh yeah you can't just let you can't just let these sharps hammer away at a price that is in theory incorrect or off the market um that's just how you just bleed money to professional betters. So um, you want that action. You just obviously just don't want too much of it, I guess. Yeah, exactly. You you want those types of players on the site, but you don't want to lose all your money to them. So there has to be some sort of balance. It does seem like some books are far quicker to pull that trigger than other ones, even if it's... I saw Feinberg complaining about it, and he kind of made the point like, you want Feinberg, like you want me as a better on your site. You want Jeff as a better on your site. As he pointed out, like, you know, how sharp can he be when he bets the Chargers to win every game? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, that's you don't want you don't want to sign up for a book and and stumble into a bad line or like a a, a line that has per been perceived to be a very valuable bet and then just be immediately cut when you you know say your your stake size is normally five hundred they cut you down to fifty bucks like that is just that's just bad risk in trading because i mean you you can't just snap judgment and, and make a judgment call off a, off a couple of bets um you i feel like you have to develop a bit of a profile um and, and kind of let them hammer away and then figure it out later but yeah stumbling into a, a one bet does not make you a sharp better and shouldn't get you cut immediately so um yeah that's in my opinion bad practice from the trading team Back to the golf odds, when you have your, and I'm just going to continue to use, we could use uh, Ludwig Aberg as an example this week at the Travelers Championship. I saw he opened at 80. By the time I got to, it's at 55. Looking at it right now, it's at 40 in some spots. Do, does each book 
weight the data that they're getting from the bets are coming in or do they also monitor other places to see like oh shit like we posted you know 30 more points on this guy than other places and we were already seeing those numbers drop so we're going to drop it accordingly because we know the sense of the market that this guy is going to be very popular or is it all internal stuff like oh shit we're getting hammered at this number we need to drop it right now bit of both i'd say a bit of both um using your patrons uh information is obviously a factor being in market is also very important um you don't want to you know like you said if someone's 40 to 1 and you're sitting and hanging in 80 um that's going to get bet and you know say there's multiple books that are at 40 to 1 on aberg and you're still at 80 like either you got to you know check internally and figure out why you're at 80 or or move it you know slightly closer to market why would why would I, you know, sell something at, at 50% off when the store right next door to me is charging, uh, you know, a lot more. So um, in today's day and age, the way you can flick through sports books on your phone, I mean, it's so easy to go from one app to another and get a price that's double, you know, double the price. You're in theory saving money. So um, being being competitive and being within market is very important. Um, one of those, I mean, I don't know how often it gets utilized here in North America, but uh the the exchange in the uk uh is one of the more telling signs of where a market is uh it is something i have personally learned over the last couple of years is extremely important in terms of figuring out if you're getting a good number if a number is off i mean you could you could think you're placing a bet at 50 to 1 on a guy and you know the exchange is at 100 to 1. i mean in theory, it could be the best price available to you, but it might not be the best price in the market. Um, it's one of the more mature betting markets in the world uh, in terms of at least in golf outrights um, with a ton of liquidity. So if if people aren't using uh, the Betfair exchange uh, to try and you know track closing line value or figure out where guys maybe truer price is, um, I would I would recommend that just as a tool. Uh, we can't use it here in North America, but um maybe there's ways around that i'm not sure but it's a good guide to uh to figure out if your bet is is actually valuable or not whether you can use it or not the information that it's giving you whether you can you know, make the bet or not make the bet but the information that it's giving you is going to be very important in you trying to actually make your bets the books possible can you explain the exchange to people because i think it's a it's a concept that people can't quite wrap their minds around unless they have some experience with it I'll do my best. I, again, I've never personally used it, but the way I look at it is, um, let's try to find it, guys. Let's say Scotty Scheffler at next year's master, the exchange price is, is 10 to one. You can, you can go there, you can bet them at 10 to one, or if you are confident that Scotty Scheffler isn't going to win the masters, you can also lay him at a higher price and, and try to get people to get buyback on, on that price. So say you post them at plus 1050 plus 1100 you can get action on your on your 1100 and if anyone else other than scotty scheffler wins the masters you win but if scotty scheffler wins the masters then you have to pay it out so essentially you're just creating yourself you're becoming the bookie as soon as you start laying prices um you can obviously just go there and just back guys and bet like you normally would um that is it's probably where you're going to get the best prices um but in, if you really want to get you know and if you have the pockets to kind of handle some of the action, you can get yourself caught as well. It's it's a dangerous, more dangerous place, just the way how quickly the money moves around. But if you are confident that, you know, even long shots like that on the exchange, you'll see a guys at like thousand, two thousand to one before tee off. Whereas any book in this in North America is probably like five hundred to one, thousand to one, maybe. So you can get a lot better prices just because guys are, in theory, more confident that player X is not going to win. Like go back to your Russell Henley case. If you're very confident Henley's not going to win the, the, uh, the travelers, you could post an 80 to one on the exchange and people would hammer that because, you know, in theory, the market should be 66 or 70. But if no one's betting at an 80 to one on your, the 80 that you've posted, then maybe the true price is 80 because if the exchange is not accepting your, you know, your posting, um, that's kind of where the market feels the price should be. Um, I hope I've made that I've made that clear, but you're essentially just removing the middleman that is a uh, a sports book, and you're just exchanging peer to peer um, on agreed upon prices. 
I'm going to have either Bamford or Ben on in the run-up to the Open Championship. So maybe I'll talk to them about it a little bit more because maybe you don't have the information on it. But how does the like pricing work? If I wanted to put up Russell Henley at 80-1 to 1 and take that action, do I then need to move my money into escrow to make sure that it's there if it loses? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I would assume you put, say you put 1,000 on Henley at 80-1. to 1, That means... That means that you have you've given someone an ability to win a thousand dollars off you at Henley at eighty to one, if that makes sense. Okay, so they you don't, they, they can only bet just, so much. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, that's why like the numbers around the majors for those are like, yeah, it's in the millions of dollars in liquidity. You'll see like the favorites; they'll be like you can win up to forty thousand dollars on a certain price on some of the favorites, um, just because there's a lot of guys either. Um, willing to sell you on that price and there's a lot of guys who are also backing it at that price if you go further down the board you know you're going to get like a couple hundred bucks on some of the long shots so um you know someone will put up i don't know eric cole 300 to one for 300 bucks so in theory the only the only bet that someone can place on that number is like a one dollar wager so you're not you're not putting up money you don't have you definitely have to um, kind of front it at, at uh, right off the go that seems like a far more fun way to bet, by the way. And I I think it's coming to North America. I, I believe there's one in New Jersey. I don't remember the name of it, but it is definitely a, yeah, it's more fun. It's also a little bit more dangerous um, just because you honestly have to be monitoring it at all times, Like if, especially if you're the one kind of fronting the money for people to bet into. Um, because if there's injury news or if there's, I mean, maybe it doesn't happen as much in golf, but, um, for other sports like, like tennis, like say you, if you're putting someone up on, uh, if you're laying Djokovic to win Wimbledon and for, uh, for some reason he, he pulls out of the tournament, obviously the entire odds boards is just going to kind of crumble. Um, and you have to be there prepared to, to kind of take your licks on the other guys that you've that you've laid as as Djokovic's number is taken off the board so it's a it's a little bit more dangerous if you're going to be the the bookie side of it but from a betting side of it yeah you're getting better numbers and you're in theory going up against guys who think they know more than you so it is a bit of a battle back and forth let's talk about the pga tour season so far i want to get into Ryder cup here in a second because i have a list of eight guys from each side who i think are on the team we can talk about the back end of those but you know i haven't heard your thoughts on the pga tour year so far and realistically like me and like a lot of people who watch this show we kind of get invested in these guys who have like i mean it's not that they're not good it's just they're not high-end players do you, do you have like a list of favorites that you're just kind of pulling for every single week like for me it was eric cole for a while i was big on ben griffin for a while i've moved on to batia as someone i just kind of bet on every single week carson young is another one the gim reaper is back on the scene i'm just rooting for him every week do you have like a personal collection of guys that you're just kind of in on I, I definitely did while I was in the content side of things before I jumped into the trading trading aspect of golf. But like, I mean, they're all the, the favorites that we kind of all have and guys you keep going back to the well with. I mean, I'm I'm trying to hit that Justin So winner for the first time. I don't know if that's ever going to come. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think off the top of my head who are some of my favorites. Uh, I mean, I've always been a big Tommy Fleetwood guy. That used to be my display picture for a while. So I was on the side with with Jeff there at the Canadian Open, um, being a little bit uh, anti patriotic and cheering for Fleetwood to pull that one out. But um, yeah, I don't have as as big of a list as guys as you, just because I don't think I've, I've I feel like you kind of get in a in a rhythm but with with content and, and putting out you know kind of takes and, and tracking these guys on a weekly basis. Whereas I'm I haven't really been in that space for a while, so it might take me a bit to to pick up some names again, but. Um, truthfully, Pat, I, I follow like almost everything you do. So anytime I see uh, Gim on the board or or Eric Cole, like you said, I mean, I've already I've already bet Gim to to win it uh, in Detroit. So um, we're on board there. It's it's whoever the community is pulling for. I'm generally involved with. I, I just saw I just got a notification from someone. They took that bet off the board. <laughs> it's no longer available to bet. <laughs> this show isn't live, is it? No, no one's tuning in live. Okay. No, no, no one's I tuning mean, in live to people that. that Maybe the people of that book are, uh, yeah, they're they've got the wires tapped and they know they know what you're you're pumping out. But yeah, that that's a that's a dangerous bet they keep posting and you're you're crushing them. 
Well, let's let's see if they reopen it or that market just completely. I mean, if it evaporates, we had a nice run and hopefully it still wins this week because it doesn't seem like they've canceled any of the wagers. That book's pretty good about not canceling wagers because we just had that problem. Jeff and I, we looked at Tony Finau futures that we had for the 3M. We had a book had, had it posted at 20 to 1. And from like, I don't know, three months ago, we were like, well, the number is not going to be 20 to one if he plays in the 3M. It's going to be a lot like we're seeing this week in Detroit. It's going to be 12 to one or probably even worse because the field doesn't look like it's going to be as strong in Minnesota the week after the Open Championship. And I'm just assuming that Finau is going to go back to defend his ground. Not even that I love Finau all that much. It just seems yeah. like a really high number, probably double what his odds are going to be. So Jeff and I both hammered it and we checked our accounts this morning. We just had more money in our account than we remembered. Uh, it came up that the bet was no longer pending. It was canceled. So then we were complaining about it via DM. Then all of a sudden, like three hours later, the bet was back in good standing. Well, that's a good uh, it's a good reminder to me because I did that same thing on that same <laughs> book this morning and noticed I had a bit more money in there as well. Uh, it was on what do you? I, I put this one out to, to Twitter. It was Tom Kim to win the Wyndham, and his price was fifty to one. Uh, I thought that was maybe. I think you'll probably be closer to 18, assuming the Wyndham field is not that strong. And Tom Kim seems to be playing a little bit better. So uh, I have maxed out on that one. And I was a little disappointed to see that it was called a, a pass posting, which doesn't make any sense because the event has not taken place. So I'm half going to reach out to them and, and, and figure that one out. It seems like they're willing to put it back on the board. They want to be bad talked and look bad on the Twitter machine. Not that we put anything yeah, out no, there, but I, I guess someone complained. Yeah, they uh, that one of the things with I mean regulated betting is uh, you're not going to get uh, canceled wagers nearly as frequently. I, I don't believe just given the competitive nature of the of the space. Yeah, it would. I mean, the the cost of losing a customer over something like that to a regulated sports book has to be very pricey over the long term because you canceled because someone might win five hundred bucks off you. Well, a player's probably worth a whole lot more than that. I mean, I know it's worth a lot more than that. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that we we tried to do at the score is, is just think about that, you know, long term loyalty in such a competitive space, um, especially when it's like everyone's just going to get comfortable with their with their sports betting apps and it's going to be harder and harder to attract new customers. So obviously we've only been doing this for a year and a bit, but being able to kind of pride yourself on on the customer service side of things, I think, is uh, one of the easiest ways to, to keep and, and attract new customers because word does like to spread that, you know. These guys are getting treated well over here. Maybe I'll go try them out. Uh, I, I'm just seeing someone responded. It was a guy who's the operations director at Circus Sports just said, books have no clue who is sharp and who is not. So they just cut off many people based on way too small of a sample. That would be long-term losers. So it's bad. It, did you find that player profiling is hard or is just you have to make an educated guess? It was... It's hard. You get the hang of it after a while, but definitely one of the more fun parts of the job and, and something I really, really enjoy doing and I'll probably miss. But um, yeah, digging into digging into their betting history, go you know, trying to track their their. I mean, everyone makes fun of closing line value and says it, it doesn't matter, but um, it really does just because in theory, those guys are beating prices. But yeah, it's uh, it's tricky. Um, you can definitely make incorrect decisions. You can make costly decisions. Um, and everything is pretty much hindsight. So you, you really got to you nail that process down. Um, trading teams will have full, you know, full, full teams of guys just tracking bets and, and monitoring patron activity and, you know, trying to profile these guys. So it is a, it's a huge part of the business and one that, um, you know, has a, has a big effect and impact on the, on the bottom line. Pozzola always brought it up, especially as it pertained to NFL, like getting a half point, getting a point, getting a minus 110 when it closes at minus 150. Like you're not, listen, you're not guaranteed to win with closing line value and touting closing line value probably always isn't the smartest thing when the bet doesn't win, but it does allow you, it affords you more losers over the course of time. And I think that's because when people think about sports betting and people think about selling picks, especially not pe people who have been betting for ages, but new people, it's like, oh, you know, this guy hit eight out of his last 10 bets. Is he ever going to lose? Probably not. Let me tell him. And he loses like 20 in a row or something like that. If you're constantly getting good numbers and good closing line value, you can afford to have more losers because your wins are going to be better for one thing. And you're not losing as much on the bets that you lose. That's correct. Yeah. I mean, everyone. Yeah. Getting closing line value is almost like the name of the game, in my opinion. And it, yeah, it's it's not just going to 
correlate to more wins and and, and increasing your bankroll it, it, you're going to lose some of those as well but it's a game again it's a game of buying and selling and if you're getting a better price than what other people are buying at later in the day or later in the week you're doing in theory a better job um analyzing the market and finding value and that's essentially what you're trying to do over the long run um if you're consistently getting closing line value especially a substantial amount um you're in theory should be winning you should be a winning better um you know over a large large number of bets if if every single one of your bets is is beating the market uh that's obviously impossible to do but um that's just kind of the almost like the number one thing people should be focusing on in my opinion but I mean, there's not a lot of people who really care about minus 110 versus minus 115 or minus 120. So, I mean, the people uh, that the people that do bet a lot of money. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and the ones that don't, they're twenty dollars versus you know winning 18 or winning 17. It's it's not that big of a deal to them in the in yeah. the grand scheme of things. They just want to be entertained. Yeah. And when you start throwing more zeros on the back end of that wager instead of 20, it's 2,000 or 20,000. Then that's like legitimate real money we're talking about here. Yeah, and I, again, those those are the ones where if 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 books are laying you know fifty thousand dollar bets on 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 bets that end up being CLV, then they've probably got to reevaluate that patron, in my opinion. Yeah, more than likely. Um, I would guess that live betters are ones that get flagged very often as well, who are just constantly beating the or finding out that your live numbers aren't as sharp as maybe they could be because you're just offering something live and they're just hammering you over and over especially on weird sports where maybe i mean let's be real like the nfl is a very sharp market i'm sure that there are sports that aren't super sharp markets yeah i mean live betting is one of those one of those things that i would encourage you know users and, and betters to take advantage of just because I mean, if you have a better sense of, of where a game's going, maybe there's an injury or the game flow just feels a bit different than what, you know, the, the closing line or the week line um, was, you know, leading up to the week. Those those live models are based on historical trends and a score, historical data. So I, it's something I would encourage, you know, people to to look into and take it, maybe not take advantage of, but, you know, try to try to bet that way and maybe you'll find more success when betting the, you know, the Sunday at noon closing line. Uh, I just think you can probably pick off a bit more value uh, while betting live. Um, golf specifically is one of my more, you know, more, probably the most fun sport to bet on live just because the numbers are so insane and the swings are so drastic. Um, and, and you know, you can get a guy at 150, 200 to one in the morning, he goes out and shoots eight under and he's, you know, he's 15 to one going into the final round. So those are some substantial uh, swings that, you know, live models might not necessarily be taking, uh, you know, taking into consideration. Um, but yeah, like, like your question said, uh, live bets on certain sports are a lot more dangerous than live bets on, on sports that are, you know, basically hundred percent based on models. Like I think about live betting tennis and it's going to be one of the most, uh, the, maybe the hardest market to beat live just because there's so much data in tennis. And, you know, when some guys love 40, you know, the exact price of that. So, um, some sports are, are easier to take advantage of than others for sure. Yeah. I would guess golf would be one that you could take advantage of a little bit more. Not to say that I have a huge, great track record of live betting golf, but you can catch some really big numbers before the market can adjust. The one I always think back to is when I live bet TPJ at Pebble beach and they were just still hanging triple digits on him when he was still in the lead of the tournament. I was like, well, he's probably not going to win but this price is outrageous i might as well bet it and of course dustin stumbles phil stumbles and ted potter jr is your champion at, ted, at pebble beach when he probably should have been like eight to one and said he was 125 to one uh being yeah i think he was one off the lead or tied for the lead at that point but he was at one of those like i think he was at monterey point or something and it does feel like unless the stars are at one of those courses in an alt rotation golf event that no one's really paying attention well, if you if you know those those events don't have shot link data, right? And a lot of the models rely heavily on shot link data. I don't know if, I mean, DraftKings is probably one of the the quicker in terms of um, updating their odds live. They have they have that product that that inputs the shots right away. So um, obviously, those are going to be a bit sharper. But yeah, those courses where there isn't shot by shot, um, you don't know when a guy hits it to six feet for birdie or for eagle. Uh, so those those are the um, you know those courses and those tournaments where the opportunity might be a bit better. Um, but if if the risk and trading team is doing their job, uh, they hopefully 
um, you know, aren't going to aren't going to bleed too much on events where the, the information is a bit lackluster. I saw Levitan tweeting about this, and I actually want to get him on to go into more detail on it, just about the, the different extensions of this one concept. But I saw the Wall Street Journal released a report about Shams during the draft coverage, how he's, you know, he's sponsored by FanDuel, he appears on those shows, and he made a tweet. I forget who ended up, who ended up going second, Brandon Miller in the NBA draft? Brandon Miller, yeah. Yeah, and I, yeah. Think, I think that he had the tweet that Scoot was going to go number two, Correct. And, it, and it shifted markets, that everyone started betting on it. And then it turned out that it was wrong. And it's like, is this nefarious that he's doing this? Like, A, they're not taking that much handle, I don't think, at least, on NBA draft betting. And this is what, I mean, FanDuel's not paying him to tweet about that. This is what he tweets about, hence why he has the sponsorship to begin with. I don't think Shams is going to put himself into a predicament about getting FanDuel money and tweeting out intentionally wrong things. He's going to tweet as he tweets, and that's just an extension of it. But other people are looking at it like, oh my God, are, you know, are they rigging the bet so people can go for it? And like, these are big publications asking these questions and it always like, harkens back to obviously you understand it better than I do but I have a general grasp of how a lot of these markets work and especially how people who are paid by gambling companies to do work how that works I mean I'm one of those people who do that and DraftKings isn't telling me things to talk about one time they said hey can you take this down as it was wildly offensive <laughs> um, and so I did like it was like yeah I understand that like don't worry about it they never told me to say anything that would be ludicrous and the what like uh, big publications are reporting like this is something that might be happening and that's just wrong like how often are places how can I word this properly Big publications doing reporting on industries they clearly know nothing about. That if I see it, it was like the, uh, season five of The Wire, where you know, here's how the newspaper works. Like I worked a bit in newspapers, and they don't work anything like that. Like, do people just get it wrong? Yeah, that's that's a slippery slope. It's tricky. I would. I mean, I'm not. I'm not going to get into the conspiracy side of things. Saying Shams is out there trying to move lines to help offset FanDuel's book. That just sounds pretty outrageous when you say it out loud and think about it. Especially, yeah, especially, especially in a limited market too. It's not like people have the ability to get fifty grand down on an NBA draft prop. Hundred percent correct. Yeah, like these aren't <laughs> these. He's not moving. Yeah, Sunday. I keep referring back to Sunday football lines, but those are probably the biggest limits. So that's probably why my mind goes there. These are these are you know promotional markets that attract people to to the storylines of the NFL or the NBA draft. Like the discussion between Scoot Henderson and Brendan Miller was talked about all year so shams is obviously just reporting what he does best i mean wojnarowski tweeted out something the day before so I, I really don't believe that that is any kind of shady business going on behind the scenes um and it, it does it, it sucks that you know a big publication is kind of putting that into kind of general you know non-sports bettors are probably picking that up and reading that article and saying whoa whoa i'm never going to get into sports betting if if this kind of shady behavior is going on behind the scenes it's just a a bad look on the industry as a whole so i i don't believe that's what's happening and and it does stink that you know so maybe some uninformed opinions uh, are getting published uh, and, and a lot of people are reading them and i'm assuming taping taking that uh, information as kind of gold and, and running with it, where that's definitely, I mean, I would be 99.9% .9 sure that is not what's going on over, over there with Shams and his tweets. No, but if they're making those assumptions about the gambling industry, and maybe that is the sports betting industry that they're making those assumptions about, but what about like the housing market? Are they just wrong about that too? <laughs> I mean, you could be right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Now we're getting into the topic of of media and uh, um, journalistic integrity, but you're right. Yeah, there, you always got to. What is what is the saying that everyone says? You know, do your own research. Uh, I've done my own research, and and I, I would tend to believe that this is not what's happening by, uh, in the sports betting world. All right. Well, that's a lot of industry talk. Let's talk about Ryder Cup because that's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get the fun stuff. We, are we, we're both going to bet Europe, right? And wait for the, the market to grow. I saw someone mention that if a European doesn't win the Open Championship, we're going to get an even better number than two to one. Just the, Europe, the European team could be underclassed for everything. But playing in Europe is a big advantage for them. It's a huge advantage. The way that these courses are set up now, it's it's 
a massive advantage. I mean, they can do it exactly how their best players or even maybe their worst players want to see the course set up. It's going to be, you know, tight with, with probably uh, small fairways. So these guys can't necessarily just bomb it out there. Although I would argue like that's maybe a setup that, um, you know, is better suited for a bomber, but um, the way they set it up in, or is it Paris, I think is, is probably what they're going to do in Italy this year. And yeah, a home home field or home course advantage, I guess, is a massive advantage. And I mean, Europe's not even like, I don't know why people are believing that Europe's bad. I guess maybe like the, you know, the last three guys on are, are kind of suspect, but Rory, Rom, Fitzy, Hatton, Fleetwood seems like he's in form. Rose is playing better. There's a lot of guys there with a ton of experience in Ryder Cups and especially winning Ryder Cups. So I'm not I'm not just going to say I say, yeah, the Americans dominated at, at Whistling Straits. So they got to be the favorite again. I think it's uh, probably closer to a coin flip than the market likes to think. And even looking at Whistling Straits, like everyone was on the American team at Whistling Straits, even at their huge number, because you just look at the course and be and just say to yourself, well, A, the course sets up perfectly for the American team anyway and the skill set that most of them have. And B, they're going to gear it for exactly what the Americans need. Like I, I played Hazeltine a few weeks back, and that's where the 2029 Ryder Cup is going to be. And I was asking Moose on the course, like I was hitting out of the rough and I could barely get it out. And obviously, you know, PGA guys can get it out. I can't. But I was like, is the rough this long during the Ryder Cup? He's like, actually, no. They basically get rid of all the rough. Not completely, like there's a big distinction between the fairway and rough, but it's not thick and it's not juicy and hard to hit out of because they want to encourage, I mean, that's a benefit for the American players that they're just going to go bomb and gouge. So they're not going to cut up the rough and make it easier for them. I mean, obviously it's easier for everyone else, uh, you know, European and American, but that really benefits the American team where we're going to see this time around, the rough's going to be like this long in Italy. (laughs) You're going to have to play from the fairway. And I think, yeah, that, that bodes well for the, for the uh, European side, um, I mean, even looking at the American team, it's uh, it's an interesting discussion and one that I feel like you and you and Jeff are going to be talking about for the rest of the summer because you got some pretty big names on the outside with guys like Wyndham Clark and Keegan Bradley playing their way onto the team, which I don't think anyone expected. So I saw a list of a, a tweet with the list of players who are on the outside looking in, and it it had some pretty big names and ones that I'd be surprised didn't make it, like. I don't know where if Tony Fina is going to be on the team or even, I mean, DJ is probably not going to be on the team. I, I just don't, there's some big decisions for Zach Johnson to make. And I think he's hoping, you know, JT and Fina really play extremely well on the, the rest of the year so they can kind of guarantee themselves a spot. So I don't know. I mean, Keegan moved up to seventh in the standing. So he is not an automatic bid. He would need to have right. a good open championship or win the BMW in the playoffs. That's the final week for the Americans. Wentworth is the final week for the Europeans to get onto the team. So the way that it looks right now and just trying to factor in, I, I mean, here's an interesting one for you because I had him under the going to make it section because I had eight on each side penciled in. Homa is currently sixth in the standings. If he continues to play like this, do you think he'll make the team? That's like at the beginning of the year, if you said that, even in like February or, or yeah, March, I'd be like, he's he's probably locked in already. But he hasn't playing well. But it, at the same time, his game feels more suited towards what the European Europeans are going to set it up to. So he's one of those guys. If he keeps drifting, that you know, Wyndham Clark could snipe his spot. Um, well, Wyndham Clark's JT, got, Wyndham Clark's on the team. I don't think he can. Yeah. Follow, I don't think he can follow out of an automatic bid at this point. And ditto with Brooks. And I don't think they'll take any other live guys. Even if Brooks were to fall out, I think they'd take him anyway if that was allowed. But he's in on points, so that's not going to be an issue. I just don't think that Homa has the equity of a Justin Thomas, where to, no. no matter how shitty Justin Thomas plays, he's on the team. Yeah, and what Homa's only played one Presidents Cup. I, I think that was yeah last year. Yeah, yeah. So like he doesn't have this track record of being an elite team player. Anyways, he played well at the Presidents Cup, but he doesn't have um you know that that pedigree he's, he's winning these smaller events i wish he would just show up at a major for once and, and play in one of those final groups and just kind of show that he can get it done but yeah you're right it's going to be an unpopular choice just because of how popular for lack of a better word that max homa has become um but he if, if he's if, if the decisions between him and, and jt and spieth i it's going to be a tough one for Zach Johnson. I don't, I don't envy his position. Um, there's other guys like Sam Burns and, and Cameron Young who are on the outside looking in. Uh, it's a, it's one of those situations where they just have too many good players. It's a, it's, it's a 
a no win really situation and the, the picks are ultimately going to get scrutinized and, and deemed if they are good picks if if they perform well or not so um it's a it's a tough spot but i mean they have a plethora of riches there in the u.s so i shouldn't be feeling too bad for them as a as a european supporter yeah, as a t- they're going to be like a two-to-one favorite when this goes off. And again, I'll like Europe regardless. And I have more faith that Europe will do a better job of picking their back-end guys to suit the course that they're playing rather than what the U.S. typically does and just take, hey, we'll take Bryson to France with us. It's like, that might not be the best idea. <laughs> Bryson in France with, I think he and played Bubba. with Phil Mickelson. And, and Bubba, they had Bubba, Phil, and Bryson. I, I, Bubba may have been an auto because I think that was the year that he won the three times, but like, these are not the. This is not the right course for those guys. That was one of the Mickelson hitting one into the water and immediately turning around to shake Molinari, Molinari's hand to concede the cup was uh, <laughs> just an all-time Ryder Cup moment. But you're right. I think that the internationals kind of showed this last, you know, last Presidents Cup, where you do have to make a bit more of a course fit, strategic choice, and not just necessarily take the the best guy. Um, I mean, they took. Taylor Pendrith, which at the time was playing really well, but didn't perform at the President's Cup. But I think everyone who kind of looked at um, Quail Hollow and, and kind of looked at the course fit, and he kind of plays that American bomb and gouge style. So I think we all agreed he was probably the best choice. But yeah, Europeans need to um, kind of look at those maybe less flashy names um, and go with someone who's more of a course fit. I, I I don't know if there's going to be an Italian on the team, which is which is sad in a way. I, I wish they could get, um, you know, Guido or, or Molinari on the team, but I just don't think either of those guys are playing well enough to to muscle their way on. Um, I, yeah, I, I, think, I, I think Eduardo Molinari is playing the best of all the Italian players right now. <laughs> I think he, he's an assistant captain, though, so we might have a, a playing captain situation there if they do force an Italian on the team. That's... That's sad to say that that's the best Italian, but um, I think, yeah, Moronk's on there. I, I do think uh, us North Americans maybe need to watch Yannick Paul's game a little bit closer okay. because I, he, I, I, I wanna... he's clinging. To... <laughs> Go ahead. Well, we, uh, Jeff and I spoke about this on Monday's show, which you haven't seen yet because we're recording this directly after that show. But, like, how do we assess how – because I, I made the point, like – Yes, Yannick Paul is hanging around based on the points on the European team, so he might automatically get in on European points. But if left up to it, what is more impressive? What Yannick Paul has done on the European tour or what Steven Jagger has done on the PGA tour? Yeah, it's a fair argument. And and unfortunately, I think it's just because less big names are playing these European tour events throughout the season, maybe. Or maybe the European tour hasn't had enough big events yet. Like, we still got the Scottish, the Open... Um, you said Wentworth in there. I think the Irish Open. So like, maybe it's just a, a scenario where it's like, okay, yeah, Yannick Paul's fourth, but wait until um, I don't even know who's on the list, but wait until Hatton or Fleetwood or, or someone of that nature gets a few more big European finish and just bumps them out of the way. Um, I again, yeah, it's it is hard to judge, and maybe something the European team has to kind of maybe look at and say maybe we shouldn't be giving four spots to European points. Maybe it should be maybe two or three. Um, again, if, if that, if they fall into a situation where Yannick Paul is getting a, a guaranteed spot, I do think they should probably reshuffle things, especially if that means one of the, uh, you know, top tier European guys on the PGA tour is being left off. European back end. So here are the eight that I have as locks for the European so, team. Rom this is going to get ugly. Rom, Rory, Vic, Hatton, Fitz, Rose, Lowry, and Fleetwood. That's a good top eight. It's a great team. Great so, eight, yeah. And that's all you really need in this is a great eight. And then two guys out of nowhere to kind of like contribute. And then you can hide two guys. So I think Moronk has to be on the team based on the way he's played. And he won at this course. And he's won three yep. times in the past year. That makes the most sense to me. Yeah, no, that's 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 definitely a guy that you have to put on. He's a rookie, but you, and you don't want too many rookies, but it, it helps playing at home. And maybe the... Actually, no, the, the, the European crowd is going to be great regardless of what country it is. I don't want to besmirch the, the golf supporters in Rome. I think they'll be, they'll be ready to go. So now we get into a situation of what do you want? For example, I think Aaron Rye is a great fit for this course. I do too, yeah. He's accurate, irons. I mean, he's everything you were looking for for a, a tight course. Um, again, he, I think he's still going to made, need to make a bit of a splash either on the the PGA tour, or maybe he goes, wins another Scottish open, but definitely someone who should be on their radar based on, on the data. So other than that, you're looking at two Spaniards, like Lara just keeps winning. 
but I don't know if you want him on the Ryder Cup team. Like in points, he's still behind like Campillo. Uh, Otagi, I don't think is eligible for the team because of the live stuff. Victor Perez is still really high up. Yannick Paul, who you mentioned, is there. Jaus Lauten continues to, I mean, the, the Dutch Jerry Curl. I'd love to see him out there. You have both Hoygaards, Thorbjorn Olison, Jordan Smith. Bobby Mack has kind of like been flushed off the face of the earth. You still have Norin kicking around, Rosner, like those type of players. If it was me, I would take Aberg. Interesting. I was going to say, I, I wish the Ho- Hoygaard twins, one of them was playing better just because you do want to get, like I said, with, with Moronk, you want to get that rookie on home soil, I think in his first start. And it, it's maybe a bit of more of a safe space. So if one of those guys pops, um, that's, that's a decent option. But I think what you're going to with Aberg is, is kind of a similar vein, get him out started, you know, throw him into the fire in a way. Um, he's playing great. He drives the ball like a, like a machine. He's, I mean, don't remember the exact numbers, but it seems like he's gaining five strokes every time he plays off the tee. So, um, yeah, he, he'd be an interesting choice. Uh, he has a little bit more to prove, but he's not he's not as young as people think. I believe he's like 23 or 24, so a bit more of an experienced, uh, fresh face on the PGA Tour. Well, I think that obviously he's going to have to play while he's 23 years old. He's still a 90 as baby. He's a 99 baby. Uh, but, I mean, this is the number one amateur, just turned pro. Like, his profile tracks... I mean, I want to say it's kind of like a better Victor Hovland, like based on his profile of what people expect him to be. Like, if you're going to be an underdog going into this anyway, why not get a guy who might be top 10 in the world rankings in 18 months? Yeah, you got to take a little bit of a gamble. And as like someone as a a 12 seed who can um, kind of maybe maybe be a difference maker, like like Peters was back at was a Hazeltine. yeah, that's an interesting topic. You should uh, you should pitch that one to who's the captain? Luke Donald. Luke Donald. Yeah, Luke forgetting. Donald. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, I mean, Stenson it, was. But. If we still had Stenson, then he'd probably be on the team as the Swede. <laughs> yeah, it'd just be all Swedes. Norin, Aberg, yeah, they'd all get spots. But yeah, I actually like that idea. I'm kind of, I'm kind of on board with you. So if we put on Moronk and Aberg, they're both rookies on the team. Like, do you then have to? lean towards like veteran presence because i think that there's a collection of pga guys that just you don't i mean you don't even really consider to be them to be european like steven jaeger most people don't even realize he's from germany they just think he's like from wisconsin or something yeah. like that because he just plays every week on the pga tour but you could take those you could take paul perez rosner i like rosner i like both hoy guards i like the danish players but i just feel like the dp world tour has been milked like is the dp world tour even as good as the corn fairy tour right now it's a valid question. And there's a kid on the Corn Ferry Tour. Uh, I don't even know how to pronounce his name. I'm not going to begin, but he's a fresh, fresh oh, yeah. Belgian dude. He's great. From Illinois. I think his initials are like ADDC or no, it's I'm... a long name, but there's a guy who's, he just won out of the gates and maybe he's better than Yannick Paul. We don't really know this at this point. I think I, his name's like Adrian. I, I got to I got to say his name. I know exactly who you're talking about. And just because I think Axis was betting him or Bearoff was betting him. Oh, some guy who gave himself yeah, the some guy who gave himself the stranger just won on the uh, on tour here. Oh, Rafael Campos was second this week. Wow, just the the corn the fairy. Rican. Yeah, the the corn fairy tour is a real blast from the past of guys that I used to bet on like ten years ago on the PGA tour. Here he is. Bearoff was Bearoff was tweeting about Marty Party Marty Flores this week. I couldn't believe he was still playing golf. I haven't heard that name in years. It, it's funny because these guys are only like forty four, and I just assumed they're like sixty five. <laughs> Yeah, they've been around the block for quite a while. So here, Let's hear it. <clears throat> Adrien Dumont de Chachet from Belgium. Oh, here we go. This guy needs to be on the Ryder Cup team. So you could do you could do the thing. I mm, Josh Teeter. He beat Josh Teeter, who's only 44. Wiley's buddy, Josh Teeter. So you have Moroc and Aberg on the team. You have two rookies. Or you can have rookie to the Ryder Cup players, but I think that you wouldn't consider like you could take Norin. I don't think anyone would be like mad about that. And he does kind of have the skill set. He's just not where he was like when they played in France, where I believe he had won earlier that year and won the French Open and then made the Ryder Cup team. But like Seb Straka, Seamus Power, Steven Yeager, Dietrich, Danny Willett. I said Rosner already. Just like these, like I, I think that the two main ones, the three mains would be like Jaeger, Straka, Seamus Power. Like they're not yeah. in consideration because they play all the time at the PGA on the PGA tour. Maybe if they were playing the, the Dutch open, they would have better points, but they don't, they play on a harder tour against better competition. 
Yeah, I mean, when you when you brought that list up, I I always I was thinking about Sepp Straka. I mean, he's a staple on the PGA Tour in a way. He's he's got to be like top thirty or top forty in the world. Um, I mean, maybe he's not as electric as some of these younger guys that you could pick, but. Sepp Straka and Seamus Power are pretty steady. And if you're, um, you know, looking for maybe not someone to win you the Ryder Cup but not lose it and maybe go out there in a in a, a singles match and hold their own and perhaps collect a point in one of those team days, I think you could get uh, a lot worse options than than Power, who's he's pretty steady. He's pretty steady. I mean, he hits the ball well. He's accurate. He's he's not going to wow you. But him and Sepp, I think, are, are solid options, although, again, not flashy and kind of just guys, but um, serviceable for sure. Yeah, Strzok is currently 37th in the world rankings. He would probably have to play some good golf coming in to get consideration, but it feels like there is no consideration for him right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I would hope that Luke Donald, they, they're using that, like, uh, what's the what's the company that um, Justin Ray works for, like 21st Club, like the data analysis company, that, that they use a lot of their numbers. So perhaps they're, uh, um, you know, maybe, maybe Seamus Power is, like, pretty high up on their big board we don't really know i mean that could potentially be true and it's not like seamus powers had the best year so far strock is having a better 2023 right. than seamus power if it was this time last year power would probably be like a lock to be on the team but he's been kind of falling off a little bit i want to switch to usa and try to fill out the back end of their team so i mean i got i kind of decided i want moronk and aberg on the team the last two spots can kind of be whoever i'd lean towards the more accurate pga guys who play Scheffler, Brooks, Spieth, Xander, Cantlay, Wyndham Clark, Justin Thomas, Max Homa, I think are all going to be on the team. That leaves four spots. Like, I didn't mention Morikawa. Like, is he definitely on the team? I mean, he's got to be, in my opinion. He plays like that accuracy-style game. I think Morikawa's got to make it. Okay, so Morikawa will put into the ninth seed. Now we got some real decisions. Like, Spieth and JT, I think, are almost auto locks here. Unless Cam Young and Sam Burns do something, they're not on the team. I mean, the way Cam Young's been playing, I don't think his game's going to travel to Europe too well. He just mashes it and, and tries to go get it. And, yeah, he's not playing great. Burns, Burns can putt. Like, that's very important in match play, you know rolling in a 25 30 footer on a team is is crushing so i think you got to consider burns but you're right these guys got to show something in the playoffs and maybe at the open championship and, and say like don't forget about me i'm also a top you know eight Amer american player so yeah i think speed and, and jt are on it i would lean burns over young right now but at the same time i feel like fowler's making a case where's fowler on the list Fowler's 16th on the list. He's Tony Finau is 18th on the points list. He's he's been doing nothing, and I mean this is kind of Finau peak season right now as you roll into these kind of mid mid to low tier events. Maybe he's going to win two or three of these and, and vault back up there. But I think Fowler has to be considered. I don't I don't know if you, what your opinion is on Fowler, but he's playing unbelievable golf right now. I, I see. When Jeff and I discussed it, it was, even before the U.S. Open. Uh, and then, you know, Wyndham Clark won the U.S. Open. Be like, who do you take, Wyndham Clark or do you take Ricky Fowler? And the answer is like, Ricky is going to have that spot unless Clark does something to get himself on the team. Then he did. So now, like, I mean, Keegan's eighth in the standings. And when I look at this course and the profile of this course, Keegan's actually a natural fit to play in Rome. Keegan's a perfect fit. Yeah, just, yeah, drive it down the middle and hit an iron, hit a wedge. <laughs> I think that's a, a perfect recipe for Keegan. I didn't really see much of the Travelers, to be honest, because... Anytime you see Keegan Bradley yeah, up by five, you probably I, I went and grabbed my golf clubs and played golf instead. So um, Keegan's playing great. Uh, I wish I bet him, but yeah, didn't uh, Fowler. Um, I feel like there's another name further down the board that we haven't. Maybe I'm. Well, I mean, Harris English is definitely not making the team. I saw his name get floated, but yeah, there's no no chance he's getting there. Uh, like, maybe it was just Finau. Finau is just so far down the list. It's going to be hard to justify picking him. If all things are being equal right now and it comes down to one spot for Ricky or Finau, I think that Ricky goes. I think that Spieth, yeah. Spieth and JT have enough influence that they'll be like, hey, take Ricky. And you know, NBC is like, you should take Ricky. <laughs> and you know who will take it the best for getting that phone call about not being on the team is Tony Finau. There's going to be zero hard feelings, zero bad, bad blood. He'll just be happy to go hang out with his family. So... I think you're going to ruffle the least amount of feathers if that's the the decision you make. But although Ricky's a, a, a 
by all accounts, an incredibly class guy too. I'm sure he'd be fine, but yeah, it's uh, it's got to be Ricky. So I mean, th- I mean, I have him as my 11th guy right now. So Morikawa, Keegan, Ricky on the team. That leaves one of Cam Young, Sam Burns, Denny, Kitayama, Zalatoris, who might be ready by that time, Harris English, Finau, Kirk, Thigala, Harmon, Henley. Hoagie, and now we're kind of into guys that are most definitely not making the team. Unless the live stuff opens up, and then Dustin's available to take. Man, if he makes noise at the Open Championship, I, I think that's his last chance to do it. I mean, Brooks had done what he did, and um, DJ would have to contend and say, look, I'm also playing incredibly well, so pick me too. But yeah, that is just... The, amount, the depth that they go to is just incredible. Um, you can make a, a second team on those guys just missing out, and you'd probably still be pretty competitive. I, I, as funny as this sounds, I don't think I would hate Denny on the team. <laughs> he put, and he's playing great. I saw his name coming up at the top of the leaderboard this past week, and I was like, Denny's about to play himself onto the Ryder Cup team, isn't he? He just – everything you said about be- – everything you said about Burns – yeah, you know, I mean, Burns won the match play. Burns is probably Burns is the better choice. He's the better player. But at this course, it kind of sets up for what Denny does. He's going to hit a bunch of fairways, uh, and he's going to make a bunch of putts. I don't know how many fairways Sam Burns is going to hit. So I, I would probably take either Denny. Kitayama has the European experience. Obviously, any like this is a great Zalatoris course if he was healthy. So let's just say we put Denny on the team. It's not going to happen. We'll just say uh-huh. that it happens. The actual U.S. team when Zach Johnson gets to pick, is going to take Morikawa, Cam Young, Finau, and Sam Burns. And I don't, yeah. and those are better players. I understand why they're doing it, but I think that this is where the European logic of pitting, picking guys to fit a course backfires on the USA team because I think that the team that I picked will potentially worse players set up better for Rome than the better players do. Yeah, I'm, I'm- I'm hoping, and if you're the American supporter, you're hoping this as well, I would assume, is that they've learned from their decisions going into Paris. Um, and, and, you know, you can't just take the quote unquote best players. You got to play, you got to take the guys who are either playing the best currently or a bit of a better course fit. Um, yeah, I think they made some mistakes in Paris that cost them. And it was pretty clear after the fact that the European setup is is not going to reward some of the the sporadic driving nature of the of the uh, your of the Americans. Sorry, so I would assume they've learned their lesson, but you never you never do know. It's kind of a once you're in the club, it's hard to get kicked out type of scenario. All right, they'll do it on the Pat Mayo experience. It's be, it's fantastic to have you back in the golf betting it, content ether. It feels like I've yeah I've taken like the the muzzle off and I'm allowed to move my <laughs> yap a little bit more about golf, which is what I love to do. Talk about betting, which again I love to do. Um, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely happy with the the decision I've made. I learned a ton on the sports book side of things, but extremely happy to ba- be back out in the content streets and mucking it up with you guys. So tell everyone where they can find your new content that's going to be coming out. Yeah, so uh, the score bet the score. The score app i guess um supervising editor there so excited to be leading a team of of talented writers and hopefully building um a more robust uh and thorough content uh product so uh we'll be covering every sport that that is available on our app so yeah i'm just excited to get to get back in there and help help people become smarter betters and and i hope that the beginning of this show shed a little bit of light onto that that you know it's not an impossible game it's hard but yeah i I just want people to make um more informed more logical and and smarter smarter bets to uh not just not just you know bleed their money away just just chasing bad numbers necessarily so i'm excited to to get back in and help people out all right you can follow eric on twitter at eat pat golf and of course you can follow me at the pme subscribe to the pat mayo experience audio podcast leave us a rating and review if you enjoy to help out the show if you don't fuck off and don't do it i suppose don't even listen fuck right off anyway leave the review please can really help us out sub to the channel sub to the newsletter and smash the like on the way out all right i'm pat may i'll be back with tambo on wednesday until then see you next time experience Experience!